and gentlemen, may I have your attention, please? Good evening. You're listening to Straight Talk with Dean and Mark. We thank you for tuning in and hope you enjoy another exciting episode of our show. Gentlemen, welcome to another episode of Straight Talk with Dana Mark. It's the 22nd day of February 222. Maybe that's a number you might want to play if you play that lotto or do something like that. But um, it's the six man Dean Geronimo in the studio on this Monday night. And from NJ to NC, I'm in the studio with my right hand man, Mark Lee. So, Mark, tell me what's good in your neck of the woods, my brother. Well, you know, we're keeping busy as always. Got a thousand and one things going on, including the Black Business Expo right here in Durham, North Carolina with Eric Kelly. So, you know, I'm just rocking and rolling, doing a thousand and one different things as always. And, of course, we just finished the Black Empowerment Week, which was a week-long event that was held in Rockingham County. We had all kinds of discussions about everything from health to uh, um, films to faith to business uh, technology, wow. to a number of other things. We were just having a great conversation, and right now we're in day one of the Black Business Expo. So, you know, they're just using my StreamYard account, and, of course, we're also having amazing conversations on IBM TV as well. As a matter of fact, we just finished doing a show with, uh, what was the name of that show we did? Mullins Music and Memories, and that featured none other than Greg Fischel, who is this amazing weatherman from none other than this area and all so definitely it was a great conversation he's been a scientist and a weatherman for probably about 30 40 years and it's just been truly amazing and all of that so definitely a great conversation an amazing conversation and i just cannot believe what was going on in that regards and then of course i found out that my team which is suffering my market warriors were like 10 and 12, <laughs> something like that. We went and did something stupid. We went and booked another game. That game was with none other than Carolina. Carolina's not having a wow. better year either, but they're having a much better year than us, and we're going to come down here on Wednesday and play in Chapel Hill. I'm not going to be anywhere near that game because i got a bunch of events going on, plus I'm scared for my guys. But I'm going to probably at least watch <laughs> it on TV and, and do a lot of praying and a lot of things along that line. So definitely looking forward to a great conversation, looking forward to many others, and uh, definitely all of that going on. So it's just going to be crazy and all of that. So yeah. definitely it's just going on. We're just having a good time, but I am scared for my Marquette Warriors and what they're going to do in the game and all of that. So that was going on, and then I did a replay for the radio show, which was my interview with Van Dorn Hennen. So mm-hmm. definitely it was an amazing conversation and all of that. So definitely having a good time, enjoying myself, and definitely keeping busy, trying to keep things rolling and all of that. But we know that you got a lot of things going on as well. Yeah. So yes, yes. definitely, we uh, definitely it's an amazing conversation, and we got a lot of things going on. But I know you keep him busy as well. So definitely, I know oh, things oh, are rolling yeah. along. You've got your things going on. Uh, we may have some folks calling in. We're gonna see what goes on with that and everything. But definitely, just true time, amazing times. And what's happening in New Jersey? Because like I said, we just had a torrential downpour. By the way, I do feel. For the people in Texas, by the way. I've definitely got to give a shout-out to the people in Texas. They are definitely suffering and all of that. So I would love to hear what you've got to say about what's going on in your world as well. Well, before I tell you what's going on in New Jersey, I just want to send condolences to the family of my good friend Greg Mason, who uh, passed away today, 50 years old, you know, so it's... It's a little surreal today because I look back at all of the times that we used to hang out 
in my hometown, Petersburg, Virginia. Outstanding ball player, a lefty at that. So, you know, God has another shooting guard now up there with him. And um, G Black, I, I'll see you when I get there. But um, in New Jersey so far, it snowed earlier today. And then the snow turned into rain. The temperature keeps dropping. So we're going to see what tomorrow looks like. Hopefully it won't be too bad. But, um, you know, we're still dealing with that. We've had snow maybe about three or four days out of this last week. So it's been interesting weather-wise, you know, waiting for spring to hurry up and get here so we can get to some warmer weather and I won't have to put this heat on and we can kind of lay low off of that, you know. And also in news in New Jersey, those who like to roll up, and smoke marijuana. Uh, Governor Phil Murphy, after three years of taking office, he said he was going to hope to legalize marijuana within the first 100 days. But he signed three bills that together legalized marijuana in New Jersey and put an end to thousands of arrests. So, you know, up here, a lot of people were getting um, those charges for marijuana possession. And um, now... New Jersey is the 13th state to legalize the use of marijuana. So wow. it does, you know, it, it actually, it was no fanfare. You know, of course, some folks are not happy about that. And um, they're hoping, they were hoping that it did not pass. But you know what? When we look at how police issued more than 2,000 charges for minor marijuana possession, and then some individuals who may have had prior convictions ended up getting even harsher sentences, you know. And so now that takes that away, which is a good thing, you know. So, I mean, I don't smoke it, but, hey, for those that do, you get to rub on, you know. <laughs> so you don't smoke it, but for those that smoke it, that's okay. I know I'm talking to a buddy of mine. Um, I don't smoke it either, but I do remember many moons ago, I went to a party and I did have one of those brownies. And I was, I was just telling this buddy of mine that I didn't smoke because I'm just not into the whole smoking thing. Maybe I got a Bill Clinton complex or something because I don't like that whole concept of dragging and, you know, the whole puff puff and all of that. But when I mentioned the brownies, he was like, and I got some of those too. <laughs> so, like I said, he was, trying to, he was trying to make a sale, you know, also go try to make a sale any way he can. Yeah. That's true, and, that's and what's going to happen that's now... That's the nature of hustles. That, that's the nature of the hustle, you know, and, and now the question is, are they going to allow um, those of us of darker hue to own dispensaries? Now, I would be interested in checking one of those out. You know what I mean? But we got to see how all of this stuff goes now, and um, some it will be some that oppose it still, and some people that will try to argue the point that it should be criminalized again, but to decriminalize it is a big step towards keeping some of our people out of prison, you know? Yep, that's a big step. I don't know whether it's a step that we're going to want to take or anything of that nature, but it's going to be interesting to see how this all plays out. I have heard that uh, I'm not sure how we're doing in the states where it has been legalized, and that'll be interesting to find out whether we're getting a lot of those dispensers or whether it's the majority of the other people that are getting those dispensers in places like Colorado, in places like California, in places uh, where it is definitely very much legal and how they're doing in those places. So it'll be interesting to see how that playing out and whether they're getting the kind of uh, support that folks thought that they might get and all of that. So it's going to be real interesting to see how that plays out and whether you can get that dispenser because this could be your uh, retirement fund since I know you got several uh-huh. years to that retirement. No, not several, bro. We, we going on getting close to, what, I got seven years and a month. So that's not far at all. When you look at 22 years ago I started and I couldn't see you know when I first started 
They say, yeah, this is a job you can retire from. And I was like, you got to be kidding me. It pays good money, but I don't know if I want to retire from this or not. Fast forward 22 years, and I said, you know what? It's been a good ride. I've seen some things. I've, uh, I've experienced some things that hopefully the majority of people will never have to see. But at the same time, I, I had a good run. You know, so to to just be there yep. and and to exist this long, I can't complain. Can't complain. You wouldn't want to complain in the first place. It's probably not worth it complaining. And I know you're not the complaining type, so definitely not no. worth it to do the complaining. And you're definitely doing what you've got to do in your life and all of that. And it looks, because I can also see the studio, like we've got a guest in the house. So we might have to see what they're going to be talking about as well, because I do see we've got somebody with a telephone number and all of that. And I forgot who I've invited, because, you know, i got a thousand and one <laughs> things going on. I think that my hands are just too full these days, so I can't remember who's who in the world and all of that. But, you know, I do love engaging in interesting conversations around the world. So whoever it is, I'm sure we'll have an engaging conversation. (laughs) Well, you know what? Let's find out actually who it is, and then we can rock from there. So thank you for calling Straight Talk with Dana Mark. You are now on the line. Tell us who you are and where you're calling from. Hey, brother. This is uh, Dr. Craig Waleed. I'm originally from Rochester, New York. But right now, I'm living in Raleigh, North Carolina. All right, Rochester, New York. Very familiar with it. <laughs> oh, yeah? oh, yeah? I've been there I, I've been there quite a few times. And, uh, yeah, nice little ride, but yeah. we made it there. We had fun while we were there. So, brother, oh, shout, yeah. out to, oh, yeah. shout out to the Shout out to the Tell us what you got going on in Raleigh, North Carolina. Carolina. And also tell us a little bit about what brought you from Rochester to here. So, yeah, man, um, I'll tell you, my family and I, we wanted to get away from the gloomy skies and the cold weather, for one. So um, that that played a big part in why we left Rochester. But also, you know, we were looking for more professional advancement as well as a better opportunity for our two young sons who are 9 and 14. And so um, that combination uh, was the emphasis that drove us from uh, Rochester to uh, North Carolina. But uh, right now... Um, I'm working at UNC, uh, working in their uh, school of social, uh, their school of medicine, in their uh, social uh, social medicine department. Uh, we're working with formerly incarcerated and incarcerated people to help bridge the gap with uh, health disparities. Tell us about some of those health disparities. I'm imagining that COVID is definitely impacting our health folks, even in uh, the prison systems and things of that nature. I know that there have been a number of prisons that have even been shut down because of uh, COVID or they have released prisoners because of COVID and things of that nature. So talk to us a little bit about the health disparity and how it is impacting us both here in the Carolinas as well as just nationally. Okay. Well, you know, I'm new to the lab. I've been there about six weeks, but, you know, what I'm going to talk about um, is pretty apparent. And one is that, you know, prison is such a congregate living and, and these congregate uh, spaces, you know, um, infectious diseases are spread like wildfire. And so people are getting high infection rates um, and co- uh, high COVID infection rates in the prisons all over the country right now. You know, but um, one of the things we're also looking at is trying to um, get people vaccinated, both staff as well as people who are living there um, as residences. And I'm also trying to imp- uh, um Encourage the, the people who are over the prisons to implement uh, protective uh, measures, you know, such as soap, water, hand sanitizer, and masks. But because of, you know, the high security issues, um, a lot of these things are not being um, provided for people. Also, um, I think that when people are living in prison, it seems as though the society and the people who are residing over them tend to forget about their humanity, about their personhood and see them simply as convicts or as inmates and forget that they're somebody's daddy, somebody's brother, somebody's lover, you know. But in, in, in addition to the COVID issue, what we also know is that uh, people who end up going to prison oftentimes are coming from very challenging backgrounds, and so they oftentimes have a lot of health challenges prior to getting to prison, which in some cases prison only exacerbates their the health disparities or the health issues, it makes them worse. 
However, sometimes uh, prison is uh, or prisoners are uh, uh, by law guaranteed the right to health care. I believe prisoners are the only United States citizens who have a, a legal guarantee to health care. However, the health care that is uh, meted out in prisons oftentimes is subpar. And so we have lots of people who are in prison with um, hepatitis C, um, hepatitis B, HIV infection, et cetera, and they may get the pharmaceutical uh, treatment that they need in prison, but the big uh, thing is that once they get out, oftentimes they don't have connections with adequate health care. So they may be released with a 30-day or 60-day supply of medication, but they don't have a PCP, primary care physician, or or a pathologist, et cetera, et cetera. So um, oftentimes their health tends to, uh, to tank once they're released. Yeah, definitely. And one of the things that you share in common, and I'd love to hear why you got into the whole work with the inmates and the prison system and everything, but actually my co-host has been working for a number of years in the prison system there in the New Jersey area, and I'll let him share a little bit about y'all's common background and all of that, but definitely he's been working there, and he's also done some work in, uh, I don't think he worked in the prison system in Virginia, but he lived in Virginia and went to school in Virginia as uh, well, but he's been up there I in New did. Jersey and all of that, but he can correct all of that that I said and get everything <laughs> in the right order so that anything that I might have said inaccurately. <laughs> you know what? My yes, first sir. seven my first seven years I started in corrections in Virginia and then relocated here to New Jersey where for the last fifteen years I've been in the prison system up here. Hmm. Dig it, dig it. Yeah, it's a tough road to hold, man. You know, um it, I'm 50 years old. Um, okay. I went to prison when I was 19. I got out when I was 27, going on 28. So I've been out of prison for like 23 years. But um, I think bad. just living in living in prison has really impacted me on a, a number of levels. Um, you know, one is that uh, I think if you live in prison um, as an inmate or as a resident, um, oftentimes you might suffer something very similar a uh, post-traumatic uh, syndrome, you know, simply mm-hmm. because of the, the trauma of living in prison. And so um, since I've been out of prison, I oftentimes have dreams about prison, things that I've seen in prison, things that happened in prison. And mm-hmm. so in that regard, it really impacted me. But also it impacted me to the point where it really forced me to change my life. And so while I was in prison from 1990 to 1997, I ended up earning an associate's degree um, from okay. one of the college programs in there, but that didn't stop. You know, once right. I got out um, in '97, I went back to one of the SUNY institutions, State University of New York, in my hometown, mm-hmm. and I mm-hmm. earned a bachelor's degree because I figured if I get a bachelor's degree, then I'll have some some uh, some ground to stand on, and people can't necessarily uh, slam the doors in my face as easy. Um, right. But once I got the bachelor's degree and I got on the job as a professional working with formerly incarcerated people, working in other uh, areas where we were providing services, I realized that I was just as skilled and just as knowledgeable as the people who were my supervisors. So I went back to school and I got a master's degree in uh, mental health counseling. But by the time I finished my master's degree, I was really burnt out from providing services to formerly incarcerated people. So I started teaching in higher ed as an adjunct. And I'm doing some independent work. Um, And during that time, I figured, well, if I'm going to teach, I might as well go ahead and get a doctorate. So I went back to school, and I got a doctorate degree in education from St. John Fisher College in Rochester, New York, back in 2018. And so um, with all of that um, experience, I ended up writing a book um, called Prison to Promise, A Chronicle of Healing and Transformation. I released that in August, and my whole purpose for writing that book was really to encourage people who've been to prison, people who are at risk of going to prison, and people who are just out here in the community who have uh, jaded perspectives about formerly incarcerated and incarcerated people to let them know that, you know, we can change our lives. And one of the things I do know about uh, people who live in prison, oftentimes they're some of the most brilliant people. Um, They just haven't had the opportunities to flourish. Yes, sir. And 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 what do you think are some of the – 
I'm sorry, uh, Dean. I was just going to ask him, what are some of the okay. misconceptions that he thinks that folks have about the prison system and all of that, and definitely about those that are in prison? And definitely, I would love for you to share more about the book. And like I said, since uh, Dean has been working as a uh, correction officer for a number of years, I'm sure he has some questions for you as well. So I've actually brought a guest this time that Dean may have as many questions as I do. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so, I, I, you know, I think some of the perceptions um, that people have, uh, particularly people who have not um, been exposed to those types of institutions, are some of the myths um, and misconceptions that are, are perpetuated through the, uh, through the popular media, you know, such as, uh, you know, prisons are oftentimes a hotbed of violence. People uh, get raped there. Um, everybody that's there is guilty. Um, some of those things, I think, are not necessarily true. Though we do know that violence happens there, in certain instances, someone may get raped. Um, but I think, for the most part, uh, prisons uh, can be a pretty peaceful place, um, contingent yeah. upon what prison you're in or what cell block you're in. You know, it seems like people who have been in prison the longer, they're more peaceful versus when you're locked up around, like, young people who are pretty yeah. uh, rowdy, you know. <laughs> but um, I think also um, some of the misconceptions is that, People believe that those people who've been to prison, again, are bad people, you know, and so they deserve what they get for going to prison. But nobody really takes the time to think about, you know, the social um, situations that get, went into helping to drive these people to prison oftentimes, which are, you know, poor neighborhoods, poor schools, and you know, um, bias all around the board. Just mm-hmm. to name a few things. Mm-hmm. Very true, very true, and, and it, it's it's weird because I started in uniform, and then two years in, started running the work education and rehabilitative release program, and that's when you know things started changing. When you first come in, you know they tell you it's us against them, ma is ma, mm-hmm. But the more I got in there and I started talking to the, the guys that were on the unit, I'm like, you know what? Some guys just got put in a situation where they had to make a choice. Unfortunately, that yep. choice did not go with what mm-hmm. the standard is. And then mm-hmm. being able to help men and women get jobs, get released, and see them out in the community, and that's what made that change for me. So coming here to New Jersey, I came into social services. And now I am in charge of the uh, offender programming for the, the state. And just oh, watch, watching that behavior change from the time they come in, it's like, nah, I'm going to just lock in, lay down, you know, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do that. But then as the brain starts to work again and they start mm-hmm. to act, activate it and to be able yeah. to say, you know what? I want to do this now. I want to do this. And they start, like you said, they start to mellow out. Some people say, oh, my God, you work with those max custody inmates. I said, believe it or not, give me a max custody offender any day over somebody who's there for two or three years. Somebody Mm -hmm. else can go deal with that because they have, they want to rock and get rowdy every day, you know. But prior to contrary belief too, I thought so before I started working in this business, I was like, man, I'm getting ready to go in here. And, you know, you watch all the things on TV and then I got there and it got real boring real quick. It's like a city mm-hmm. within a city. So what happens yep. out here happens in there. You got the cops, yep. you got the people. So, you yep. know, 98% of the days are very boring. So whoever's listening right now, if you discount what I'm saying, I got 22 years in the game. And, you know, like, <laughs> you, you go in and you say, hey, man, just let me come out the same way I went in. But it's based off of one thing and one thing only, and that's respect. And yes, in order sir, to get that respect, it. in order to get that respect, you got to be respectable. So, mm-hmm. you know. Some some don't catch that concept. They come in, they say, you know what, you're locked up. I tell you what to do. I'm God to you. Blah 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 blah. blah. And then it's like, mm-hmm. yeah. And then you got, you know, the rest of us that come in and say, look, man, here's the thing. If I catch you doing it, I gotta write it up. I know you're gonna try it anyway, but it's it's a game of cat and mouse. Or yeah, we 
we can live together right now for these eight hours, these five days a week or these 12 hour shifts, whatever shift I'm on. When I come in, I'm going to let you live. I'm going to let you do you. Just just right. don't make it difficult for me. And when you keep right. it peaceful, you'd be surprised at how uh, sometimes it's monotonous. It's like, all right, guys, you know what? Everybody's going to the law library. Line up. Everybody's <laughs> going to class. Line up. You know, I got to pat you yeah. down, dog. Pat you down. You yeah. go to class. You do your thing. You come back. You know you're coming back to a peaceful house with me. I can't answer for that's any right. other officer, but when I'm on this ship, I'm going to keep you safe. And that's the other thing. If they don't feel mm-hmm. safe, they're going to act right. out. I'm not going to put you on right. front street. If I got to talk right. to you, I'm going to pull you to the side. Be like, you know you're not supposed to do that. Come on and work with me. Help mm-hmm. me help you. That's that respect. And that's yeah, respect. that respect is yeah, respect. And that's actually one of the things you even talked about, or at least they talked about on your uh book um, jacket and everything in terms of some of the things that they're talking about on your Amazon reviews and everything. I know that one of the things that they mentioned was you said that prisons uh, scared you straight and I know that that's something that people talk about even with like the scared straight movements and all of that and you, mm-hmm. one of the things you said that I found interesting is you said that while in prison you came to recognize what you are and uh what you were not, and it was able for you to create an internal space where you found the freedom to explore and reconnect with who you are. So it sounds like you definitely had a chance to kind of like come to terms with your own identity and all of that. And it also sounds like you were saying that earlier you thought um, before you went in that your prison, that your thinking was more limited and full of false information. So what were some of those false information ideas that you had, and how did prison help change those ideas? Well, you know, I, I, I'm thinking like professionally, for one, right off the muscle is, you know, I used to think that I, I, I was not an intellectual, that um, that I didn't have the cognitive capacity to think and to create ideals. I figured that I was more like a machine, you know, um, an athlete to use my body all the time. Nothing wrong with people that do that, but I thought that that's where my limitations were, that I could just use my body. I thought women were objects. Um, I thought that violence was the way to go. And not for nothing, I think from even younger, I was convinced and bamboozled to believe that by going to prison, I would somehow become more of a respectable person and uh, get my man card. Um, but, again, once I went there, I realized that that wasn't the truth, you know. And I think um, your co-host, the brother, um, mentioned how, you know, once you get in there and your brain starts working. And so what happened is um, I was at distance from a lot of the things that um, – distracted me and a lot of the things that I connected to that I thought were representations of me, you know, like getting high, getting drunk, getting the girls, you know, sexing this girl, that girl, and the next girl, you know, having the gold chain, having the leather sneakers, all these things I was basing my 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 quality or the purpose of who I was off of these things that I had. But once all of this stuff was stripped from me, you know, and the drugs weren't there and the alcohol wasn't there, the girls weren't there, the cars, the clothes wasn't there, all I was left with was myself, just myself. And so when I'm with myself, what, what else can I do but commune with myself? And once I began to commune with myself, I began to realize all the things that the elders would tell me over the years, such as, man, you're a smart dude. Yo, man, you know, you got a lot of potential. But I didn't believe that because I think I bought into so many myths that the world had given us about what it means to be a black man, a black boy, a black child coming up in this world. And all of those things were things that were really negative and and meant to tear me down. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. And when did you decide that you wanted to write the book? Was it while you were in prison? And what got you into writing the book? And how did the whole book writing process go with you? So how did you actually come around getting this whole book concept? Yeah, well, that's a great question. I appreciate that, brother. I'll tell you, while I was incarcerated, um, I did eight years. And so about halfway through in my fourth year, um, I'm seeing guys going home, coming back. A lot of guys were recidivating. And, you know, that made me afraid that, you know, that's going to be my reality when I get out. But so what I started doing is talking to a lot of these men who were coming back on second, third bids, on violations, and picking their brains about what did they do that caused them to come back. And so I, I began strategizing for myself. This is what I'm going to do to make sure I don't come back. You know, I'm going to go to school. I'm going to build a a pro-social network. You know, I'm not going to use drugs and alcohol. You know, I'm going to go to the right places and not the wrong places. And so categorizing all this in my head, I figured, okay, I'm putting this plan together while I'm in prison to enact it when I get out. But also 
once I started acting it, I'm telling myself this when I'm in prison, I want to be able to share this information with other people. And so that's where the idea of the book came from. I figured I'd write this stuff in a book somehow, you know. But eventually I ended up, the book, is it shares some of my, my mechanisms for staying out of prison, but it also uh, talks about some of the things that went into um, shaping me and conditioning me to become a, a violent person that led me to prison. But the, the book writing process is, is, is quite arduous, bro, um, and it, it takes some time. And um, there, was, there was plenty of times that I, I was writing and then I stopped writing um, because there were other things going on in my life, and I put it down for a year or two and then pick it up for like six months or 30 days and then put it back down. So it's, it's a back-and-forth thing. Um, but some people, you know, they'll they'll just sit down and write it and go right through with it. But um, the whole process, once it got to the finish line, and um, I had what what we have now, this book, Pr- Prison the Promise. Um, I'll tell you, it was a very cathartic um, and very freeing um, exercise because um, again, I was able to express some of the things that I I kept maybe just kind of bound up in my own emotional space that I did not necessarily share with other people in my life. Um, and so, yeah, I, I'm really happy to have written this book. And um, my hope is that other people who've been impacted by prison, by the legal system, um, or who have young people who are at risk of um, being impacted by the legal system, to pick this book up and, and read it and maybe uh, glean some information for themselves to, to light their path along the way. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. I know another thing that you mentioned in your uh, book and everything is the fact that, you know, a lot of times we get stereotypes that people that are in prison, and you mentioned this earlier, are coming from the rough streets or things of that nature. But it sounds to me like what you've been saying is that you actually came from a fairly what people would consider a straight-laced family and then got involved in things much later on and all of that. So could you share a little bit about yeah. that story as well? Because definitely that's one of the things that, you know, people might be surprised at because a lot of times we do get those stereotypes that folks that are in prison are coming from the uh, rough streets of uh, New York, the rough streets of Durham, or just the rough streets in mm-hmm. general. Absolutely, and I think you hit it right on the head, man. You know, though I came up in a, a single-parent home, um, we lived in a pretty uh, – middle-class, working-class environment. You know, I spent part of my life in the city of Rochester and the other part of my life in the suburbs of Rochester. You know, went to private schools, went to urban-suburban schools. You know, I had a lot of things that some of my friends didn't have, though it was just my mother there. But I think, again, because I didn't have uh, maybe constant um, tutelage, constant guidance of um, um, a solid male figure, though they, those solid male figures were in my life, they were my family. They weren't there continually. And so I felt victim to a lot of the, the misrepresentations of what it meant to be a black boy or a black man, you know. So, you know, I grew up coming off the, the, the tail end of the black exploitation films, you know, like Shaft and all of those things. And so though I was young when those came out, or maybe not even born, but as I came of age, I started buying into those concepts again that this is what this is what it means to be a black dude. This is what it means to be a black boy. I got to be tough. I got to be hard. You know, I can't be soft. And then especially because I lived in this this pretty cushy life, you know, um, living in the suburbs and living in a middle class um, environment, I figured I got to let people know that I'm a thug, that I'm hardcore, and that no matter what I have, you know, I'm still bout it, you know, whatever that was the word, you know. But there we go with the, the, the youthful ignorance. So I really didn't understand what was what life was worth at that point. Yeah, uh, definitely going to understand that. And I think there's a lot of youth that are still having that attitude even to this day and everything. So what is one of the number one things that is you're going around doing a lot of your work as also a motivational speaker that you try to give to these youth when you're talking to them? So what are some of the things that you try to bring from your experience to talk to them about? And I know a lot of them may also see that you've changed your name and definitely are thinking that, you know, that you've gotten involved with the uh, Muslim society. And we do know that a lot of times folks have this attitude that that's part of the reason that you've reformed and things of that nature. So what are some of the messages that you share with the public when you talk to them? Yeah, absolutely. Well, let me just start right where you ended, which was talking about my name. Uh, My my last name is Walid. I definitely changed it. Um, And I changed it because some of the people who I was pretty much studying under and was um, at their tutelage, they happened to have gone the Islamic route. And so, you know, it, it was really in homage to them. And one of the brothers, he says to me, you know, it seems like you've changed a lot, brother. It's like you're a new person. 
you know, and how about if we gave you the name Walid? And Walid means newborn or reborn. And so I think the change that I that I that I brought about or they helped me uh realize in my life was to be a newborn, a reborn person coming back into my full self. But one of the things or some of the things that I try to um put upon or tell young people is to recognize who you are, you know, um, maybe get away from those things that distract you and tap into yourself, find some quiet space and start asking yourself, who am I? What do I want? What do I want to do? What am I good at? What do I need to do to get better at something that I want to learn about? But always learn. You know, I found that for me, learning was the, was the key, learning about myself and then learning about my gifts and my talents and how I could use my own personal gifts and talents to, to uh, should I say, um, help other people that I come in contact to, to help brighten up the world a little bit. But really it started with myself. And one of the other things I think is very important is to recognize where you're hurt at and seek seek help, seek healing you know, seek therapy, whatever it is, because many of us have been hurt, man, you know, especially mm-hmm. young boys. You know, we've been hurt uh, physically, psychologically, sexually, and we don't talk about it, and we stuff these feelings, you know, and these feelings, they come out backwards. They come out hostile. They come out aggressive. So really finding some healing, man, you know. Because that's one of the things I don't think we talk enough about, and I would love to hear your thoughts about that as well, because I do know that, yes, uh, um, young men and even men that are in their 30s and 40s and 50s are sometimes emotionally hurt or even physically hurt and definitely go through a lot of other kinds of pains. But we've always got that tough guy mentality that we can't talk Mm -hmm. about our pains and things of that nature. So Mm -hmm. it sounds to me that one of the things that with your growth that you have found is that we actually need to talk about those pains whenever we've gone through them, whatever those pains may be. So I'd love to hear your thoughts about that as well, because I do think that that's something that we don't do enough of is share our own pains and what we've been through. Absolutely. And I think that that is very cathartic to be able to talk about your pain. You know, at the seat of who we are, man, is emotion. And it's our emotions that connect us with other people. You know, though we may not have gone through the same things as other people, we've all felt similar or the same emotions at certain points in times. And so I think learning, again, who I am and understanding that, you know, I am cognitive and I am emotional. I'm not physical. You know, physical is just like it's a building. It's a garment that I'm borrowing for a short time, and it houses my emotional and psychological self. And so at the seat of who I am is that which thinks, that which feels, and that which knows that I'm thinking and feeling. And so when I can take time to get that part of myself um to a balanced place, though balance is never constant, but to a place where I can always work on being balanced, I think then I can start treating other people better because I start learning to treat myself better. And so when I'm treating other people better, treating myself better, this is how we create harmony. And when we have harmony and peace, this one I think we can be our best selves. You know, so really I think man equals mind, woman equals mind. And so when we get our mind right, everything else will fall into place. But, again, I think that um, we've been conditioned by this world that we live in that uh, to believe that there's only certain types of emotions that men are safe to express, you know, such as anger, hostility, you know, um, and some of these other so-called masculine emotions, whereas other emotions are considered for women or females. And we oftentimes hear men saying to each other or saying to their young boys, stop acting like a girl. Oh, only girls cry. But no, that's a human thing. So I think we have to reframe um, what it means to be a man and understand what it means to be a person. And when we can come into that, becoming a healthy person, I think we'll be coming uh, more in tune with our emotional, psychological selves. And that is where the balance lies. It's definitely a balance that needs to be had by more and all of that. Now, I know one of the things that you've been involved with, and I've actually had other friends that have done this kind of work as well, is the whole concept of restorative practices. Now, some of our listeners may not know exactly what that is, but I know that you're a facilitator in that field. So for those that are watching or listening, I should say, that don't know what restorative practices are, share a little bit about that uh, work and how you're involved in that work. 
Oh, yes, yes, indeed, brother. Well, you know, let's just think about the word restore, you know, and look at the, the, the prefix re, you know, and oftentimes most words that start with re, re, um, it means to do again, you know. So when we restore, what we're doing is we're bringing back something that was lost, something that was broken, something that, that's missing. And so with restorative practices, the, the, uh, the foundation is about relationships, because the belief is that where there are strong relationships, there's less of an opportunity or less of a likelihood that people will offend, offend each other because they are in relationship, be they brothers, sisters, lovers, neighbors, but they have, as we talked about earlier, a respect for each other. And so if there is a violation of the relationship, um, it is much easier to help bring about some healing. And so the restorative practices is really about healing relationships where they've been broken and strengthening relationships so that things won't be done to uh, fracture the relationships. And so some of the things that we do, uh, they're really borrowed from indigenous cultures, you know, and restorative practices such as, you know, sitting in a circle, you know. I mean, I think every society has sat in a circle you know, and the circle represents, you know, equality because there's no sides on the circle. There's no higher and there's no lower. And so oftentimes when people have offended against other people, we bring them together in the circle and we have um, discussion about who was offended, um, how, how were they offended, how did that leave them feel, and, and what are the things that they need the other person to do to help them feel reconnected, whole again, or to have the relationship restored. Yeah, and definitely that's something that we need to have more of just in society in general. Uh, what has been some of your takes just about some of the um, activism that's been going on in the world and things of that nature? I know that we've definitely had um, a number of Black Lives Matters protests even here in the raleigh Durham area and, of course, around the country, and we did see the uh, opposite side of that, those reactionary people storming the, the uh, White House and basically doing a lot of things that if we had oh, tried wow. to do, we would have been totally <laughs> uh, put under the jail probably and everything. So definitely I'd love to hear your thoughts as one that is an activist in terms of how we're doing in terms of the Black Lives Matter movement, but also how we're doing in terms of even dealing with some of the reactionary forces that are out there. And I do know that some of those forces even exist, because I've talked to Dean about this, within the prison culture as well. So I'm sure that you've even had dealings with some of these folks even when you were in the prison culture. But I would love to hear your thoughts about how we as a society are doing in terms of, one, supporting Black Lives Matter, and two, in terms of dealing with some of these reactionary forces. Yeah, brother. And, you know, I think that we have been um, at this place where we are for a long time, but it seems as though maybe there is greater movement when we look back over the generations, you know, when we are having protests and when we are having resistance. Um, I think that we've been doing this since we've been here um, or since we've been brought to this country. But I think now in this day and age, it seems like um, we have an impetus, we have some momentum, and um, I think that it's important that we continue to let our voices be heard, that we continue to protest, um, because that, really I think that's one of the only ways that we can get anything done is to protest, you know, and to also, and when I say protest, that doesn't just mean going out in the streets and shouting or throwing bottles or singing We Shall Overcome. You know, I think a, a big part of protest is pulling our dollars together as well, you know, and maybe squeezing some of these corporations to stop spending our money with them, you know, because we are, I think, the, as black people, the biggest um, spenders in the country. We have the most economic power. But I really am proud of the young brothers, the young sisters, as well as the older folks who are out there protesting, out there demanding truth, justice, and equality. Um, but like anybody who's holding on to their power, who has a, a superior um, mindset, they don't want to let it go. And so I think this is why we're seeing um, the resistance coming back towards us, and we're seeing it coming heavy, you know. That's why they continue to kill us. I think that's why they continue to put us in prisons and jail, because they're trying to silence and scare us. But I think that nothing changes and sell unless something changes. And I think that we have continued to up the ante. And so I think that the more that we protest, the more that we get out there, the more that we show ourselves and let people know that we see your wrongs and we're demanding something different, um, I think that things will get better for us. 
Yeah, I definitely agree with you on that and everything. What are some of the things that you think you've learned the most since you've been out that have surprised you? Like I said, I know a number of times we're surprised by things that we learned. There definitely you've expressed some of the things that society uh, needs to know, but I would love to know some of the things that have surprised you about yourself that you found out about your own inner journey and your own introspection, both as you have come out and also as you have gone through your education system and also gone through a number of other things as well. Yeah. And thanks for that. That's a great question as well. And I think one of the things that I really um, continue to be marveled at about myself is um, my ability to teach and lead. You know, I, I, for years I just thought that I wasn't a leader, I wasn't a teacher, and I didn't have anything valuable to say. Um, but as I look back over my 23 years since I've been out, you know, I've had lots of different people, particularly younger people, some people my same age, who continue to consult with me, continue to follow up with me, to seek my advice, to seek my insight, um, and to to some degree, I guess, get my stamp of approval on some of the things that they're doing. And so that continues to humble me um, because, again, I just see myself as Craig. This is Craig, you know, but when people call me Dr. Ali, it's like, hold up, they're talking to me. That's right, I'm not just Craig. So I think just understanding my own potential um, to teach and to lead, that has really surprised me. Well, definitely some great concepts that you've had and everything. I've actually got to run and do one other quick errand, so I'm going to turn you over to uh, Dean and everything and let him have some questions for you. But I will be back with more insightful questions. So, Dean, I'm turning it over to you just for a hot second. <laughs> Peace, brother. No, no problem. <laughs> it's, it's a different world. You know, one thing I did want to say is um, the community has to realize that they are also responsible in assisting with uh, individuals transition from incarceration to community. Yes. Um, yes. There are oftentimes where, you know, the question is, what is the Department of Corrections doing? Right. And then, okay, what are we doing? We have the six core programs that we provide to the offender population and we're just one component because we're separate mm -hmm. from the education department the you mm -hmm. know spiritual department the chaplaincy department which covers a number mm -hmm. of religions so there, there are a lot of things that are geared towards um, positive social change but then man comes home and everybody mm -hmm. gives him a cold shoulder whose fault yep. is it at that point you know right that's that stigma that the society uh, places on those of us who've been incarcerated. And so that's like resentencing us all over again. Right. You know? And you right. think about it, man, um, maybe 90% of the people who are incarcerated will come home. Yep. They're going to come home. And so they need to have um, access to education. They need to have access to training. They need to have access to a job. Or else, chances are, you're going to become the victim. You're exactly yeah. right, and, and, and people complain, you know, like, well, what do they do all day? I still would believe it a lot. It's a whole bunch of, and you, you, you said it prior, there are a whole bunch of uh, brilliant men and women who made a mistake, and yeah. they, they went to prison not for punishment but as punishment. So it's like right. time out. You got to put you here, sit you down for a little bit. What you mm -hmm. do and like you said, rehabilitation starts with the offender. So now what you do while you're in timeout depends on whether you come out a better criminal or a better person. Mm -hmm. Pick, pick mm -hmm. which way you want to go. But still, yep. the community has to let go of those, oh, well, I heard this and I heard that. It's not what you hear, it's what you see. You know, mm -hmm. you can hear a thousand things about a person and prejudge them, but then mm – -hmm sit down and have a conversation with them. It'll change your mind. It'll change Absolutely. your mind. You know, and so that's, that's what the biggest thing now is trying to link that bridge where it's like, hey, we have these individuals we just released uh, in November because of the COVID almost 2,300 men and women. Right. And, you know, to get all of that stuff ready for them, get the IDs, birth certificates, social security cards, 
mm-hmm. uh, motor vehicle IDs, GA and SNAP benefits for those who are young enough, register for selective mm-hmm. service, um, you know, all of those different things. And, and I remember one of the young men asking me, he was like, what do I need to do this for? I said, well, I don't think anybody ever told you, but it's a federal law mm-hmm. that upon your 18th birthday, you need to register with selective service. Not saying that That's you're right. going to not saying that they're going to draft you because knock on wood, they haven't had a draft since Vietnam, but yeah, you still have to yeah. register. He was like, man, anybody ever tell me that? And I was like, okay, well, I'm going to ask a personal question. You don't have to answer it if you don't want to, but were there any men in your life, like constantly in your life? He was like, yeah, my dad, he didn't even tell me. I was like, wow. So it's yeah. a disservice that yeah. we do sometimes to ourselves where, Absolutely. you know, the next generation comes and we don't give them. And I, I'm right behind you in age. So our generation kind of dropped the ball. It's like you had old school, the elders and ancestors. You had to mm-hmm. learn, you know, mm-hmm. manners and all of these different things. And then as we start to get older, some of us had kids and say, you know what? That was abuse. I'm not going to do my kids that way. So then yeah. you try to be friends to your children. Right, As your right. children grow up, they don't have a respect for you because they look at you just like they look at their homeboy that they just went outside, played ball with. They cussing each other out, and talk smack with each other, and yeah. doing all that. So they come home, and it's like, well, yeah, I understand you the person that had me and that created me, but... Mm-hmm. uh. Mm-hmm. Other than that, you know, you really can't tell me what to do because uh, it's 10 o'clock and I'm 12 years old and I'm coming in the house. All right. You ain't saying nothing. So I'm going to go back wow. outside. Yeah. Whereas yep. our generation, we came in the house. Man, the street light used to come on in my hometown at 6.03. Yeah. And I always remember, flooding, you better get, in. get home before 6 o'clock. Because as long as I'm at home, I go in the backyard, try to shoot ball till it got dark or whatever, but they could hear that ball bounce and they knew I was at home. Because if I wasn't in that house or in that backyard, the beatdown was coming. Oh, yes, sir. Oh, yes, sir. And mama was, my mom, God rest her soul, was the supreme beatdown queen, you know. And and (laughs) then after that beatdown, my father worked night shift. So he came home like 11 o'clock. But guess mm-hmm. what? Ring the bell for round two. Now you all broke up. You're trying to get some sleep. Yep. You know, already got beat Wake down. Right up. And the door yep. swing open like, get up. Oh, my God. Uh, here we got to get it again. Like, <laughs> <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Beat what they see. All those different mm-hmm. things. And, and some people will say, well, that's abuse. And I was like, nah, because of those things. There were some times I did things I had no business doing. But then there yeah. were other times where it was like I had a fear of a five foot three inch woman and a five foot six inch man that mm-hmm. I was like, you know what? Man, my father's still living. He'll be eighty three years mm-hmm. old in April. And oh, even bless, still, man. even still, he ain't as fast as he used to be, but I still ain't mm-hmm. gonna try him because for some odd reason, I believe that he might just snap back to, like, 40 years <laughs> old and put something tough on me, you know. And, and yeah, those are the things. Respect, though. Right. And those are the things that, you know, we didn't do. And mm-hmm. as a community, that they never bothered to give individuals a chance. I always say people only realize one of two ways how their perception is so different from reality. And that's either go work in the prison system or have Mm -hmm. a family member enter the prison system. Mm -hmm. And once you have a family member go to jail or go to prison, you start looking at it a different way because it's like all that stuff that was on TV, oh, that was entertainment uh, for somebody. But this, this this is not how it's really going down. Oh man! Now my cousin yeah. or my brother or my son or my daughter now they're incarcerated. Mm-hmm. Now we have to check on them just to be sure because there are some individuals there to, like you said, treat them as less than. So now yes. 
yeah. conversation start off like if I'm calling you on the phone like now I'm like hey doc you all right yeah I'm good you know blah 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 mm-hmm. but if one of us were behind the wall it's like hey man everything all right and it's a different yeah. tone to that <laughs> are you all right that we, yeah. we we have to you know and and I hope that like I tell the dudes all the time put me out of job man just once y'all get out, right. don't come back. Don't come back. And, right. and we're doing something here in New Jersey, right? We have closed in the 15 years that I've been in this department. We've closed three wow. prisons, man. We closed three wow. prisons. That means we don't have enough people or uh, inmates to to fill these jails. So guess what? We shut them down. And shut them down, they, right? They they, they not all the pass. Right. They not passing away. And they're not moving all out of state. That means they're changing the game of what they do so mm-hmm. that they don't come back. And that's a great right. thing. That's an outstanding thing because, like I said, I got seven years left, man. And, and I'm like, in these seven years, if we can close another prison or two, we could talk some trash. I'd be like, yo, I don't know what y'all doing in y'all states, but here in New Jersey, dog, yeah. we had, you know, we had 14 prisons. We down to 11. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and it they wasn't because of budget down. constraints. You know, it wasn't mm-hmm. because of a budgetary issue. It's because men and women got out and they changed the game and they're doing it a totally different way. So now they're not coming back. They are mm-hmm. they're spending that time, you know, it may take a while to find a job. It may not be mm-hmm. as easy. In fact, it's three times as harder because you have an extra strike. But, That's right. you know, for us, like I try to tell some of the guys, I said, we were born with two strikes, black right. and male. Yeah. I said, yeah. the most yeah. dangerous species on the planet that hadn't done anything to anybody. <laughs> it just existed. Is the black male. So now yeah. you're already Growing up with those two strikes, little boy, you don't have no clue. You got two strikes, and now you're trying to grow mm-hmm. up, and you now through you know we're learning different things, some right, some wrong, and then you get that third strike. Yeah. So and now it's, it's hell okay. Right, and they, they said, shoot, a a a a black man who's never been in trouble still has a harder time than a white convicted felon. Finding a job. Absolutely, absolutely. You know, There's been research on that, blind yep. research on that, and they've shown and proved that. But you know, that's why I tell brothers, you know, if you find yourself getting locked up, if you find yourself in these types of situations, the best way to reverse it is to get yourself educated, trained, certified, degree, licensed up, and change your network, your social network, and start right. borrowing the 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 integrity of good people to help you get in good standings with other good people. But the oh, only yeah. way you can borrow somebody's integrity is you got to start showing some integrity. You right. Know? Cause I, I give you some, I definitely give you mm-hmm. some. It's like, you know, and then they say, well, school ain't for everybody. I said, man, you're right. School is not for everybody, but trades get paid. And if I had known yeah, that right. bit of information oh, before on. I went to college, Brother, I would have mm-hmm. learned how to do some carpentry, some plumbing, yes, sir. Uh, yes, uh, sir. you know, cut hair, bury dead bodies, all yeah. those trades <laughs> that make a whole lot more money. In fact, if yes, I sir. had that trade, if I was an electrician or something, I could have been wiring houses and paying for college yeah. and walked out of that debt tree without a loan. Plumbing, them yes. plumbers get big paper, too. Right. All them trades, man, you know? Yes. But even so, that, you got to go to school for that. You know, right. It's just a different type of school, you know. But the whole thing is, is to become educated, to become skilled, you know. Mm-hmm. So many of us, I think, still have become fixated with trying to beat the system, you know. Right, right. And then there's some that and when they try to beat that system and they realize that the game is set up totally different. It's not designed mm-hmm. for you. It was designed mm-hmm. to beat you. So uh, you got to learn right. the game. You got to learn the game first. Right. And then once you learn the game, then you can find out where all of the holes are that you may right. be able to finagle your way through some of it. And then mm-hmm. but once you learn how to play the game, 
and play it better than the creators of the game, mm-hmm. then you start to elevate a little more, you know? And, and right. it's say, it takes a little time because all of us are stubborn. And mm-hmm. it's a little thing called pride. So if you were yeah. a man out in the street and everybody knew you were the man and then you come to prison, you, you know you're not the man no more. You're the man that's locked up. Right. But that's in, right. in their mind, and you know you know what I'm talking about. You got the dude on your unit, man. Talk about how he was that dude, like untouched. Right, right, right. And then right. he the dude getting the energy bag every week. And you like, well, bro, if you were getting it like that, where the hell is your money? <laughs> right, 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 right. But where the know, hell are your visitors? You know all those different things. Uh, and we and we know the reality behind that, man. A lot of times. But I think you said something real heavy, too, though, man, which was, you know, that ego. Many of yeah. us have that ego. And that ego, I think um, one of them holy books would talk about, you know, before the before fall, uh, pride cometh before fall. Pride cometh before degree. the fall. Yep. Yeah. Yep. But I think it's really important for us as, as people to recognize, you know, the place that that ego plays in our destruction and learn to to slay that ego, learn to lay that ego down, put them aside. Because without, I think, without arresting our own ego, we continue to put ourselves in precarious predicaments. You know, we continue to put ourselves in situations that can cause harm and hurt to ourselves and other people. And it may not always be uh, physical. It could be psychological or financially Mm -hmm. or some other way. But I think the ego is a big problem. And most of the times we don't recognize that, and it drives us towards right. our doom. Because we mm-hmm. feel so that, that we feel that it can't happen to us. For some odd right. reason, we we have that thought that, oh, you know, well, my man's got knocked off, but that's him because he was stupid. And it's like, dude, right. you do the same damn thing. Like, you just happened yeah. to go to the bathroom when they came and um, kicked in yeah. the door, and you went yeah. home. Came back, he was locked up. You call him stupid, uh-huh. but you were right there with him. Right there with him. It reminds me of quite a few guys I met back in the days when I was doing my my time. You know, um, some of those guys would say, "Man, I know I messed up that. So this time when I go out there, I'm going to do it this way instead of that way, and they won't catch me this time." <laughs> and I'm thinking, "Oh man, you know, let me get away from these guys. I need to be around some people that's thinking deeper and, and stronger." You know? Yeah, yeah. What they said, that stinking thing is. <laughs> oh yeah, man. Oh yeah. You know, and, and and in essence, and that's who we are. We are that entity that thinks and feels and knows that we think and feel. But we have to also be capable of knowing when we're putting out some really bad thoughts, some really bad vibes. You know? Right. Because that's what's going to save us, and that's what's going to save our communities. That's what's going to save our families. You know, and that's what's going to make us better. You know. But until we do that, I think people will continue to go back to prison because they haven't learned to slay their ego. And then, as you said, you know, the game has been made that way to capture right. people, to put them right. in these in these uh, these positions where they're behind the eight ball. Makes me think of something most Death said, the rapper. Mm-hmm. You know, he said in one of his songs, I think it was Mathematics, he said, uh, you know, the killing fields need blood to graze the cash cow. You know, it's a number game, but the... The stuff to Number up don't add up somehow. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Yes. You know what I'm talking about. Yes, because yeah. so at the end, happened, he said, uh, what he said, the one straw that broke the camel's back, how they treat it, the million other straws underneath it. It's all it's bad. All mathematics. Yes, sir. Yes, he sir. He said a whole bunch in that yeah. song because it was like young bloods can't spell, but they can rock you in PlayStation. Like yes, all sir. those different yes, things. Sir. If you're not paying attention, you'll miss it. And mm-hmm. he just he hitting you all in the gut. Like, come on, y'all, get it together. Because yep, yep, when yep. it add when it doesn't add up, that's when you end up messed up. And you're trying to figure yeah. out where you went wrong. And like you said, there's a lot of guys that say, you know what, I I know where the mistake was. Like they're playing a video game. Like, all right, when I get to this point. <laughs> Next time, I'm not gonna go to the right. I'm gonna go to the left because well, if I go to the right, 
Yeah, like yeah. the cheat code don't work because now they on the right and the left, and as soon as you get to the fork of the road, they're gonna say, you know what? We we closing in on you from both sides, so come on back here. Mm-hmm. We got to put you in timeout again because you didn't figure this out. Stop That's playing right. this game. That's why, I, again, I say, you know, it's important for people to know themselves. And then once they start to know themselves, they can start to realize what their strengths are, what their pro- proclivities are, and they can start applying that towards something that's going to help build their life instead of destroy it. Exactly. And not only know yourself, respect yourself. Because then when oh, you, you have that respect for self, there's certain things that you're just not going to do anymore. Hey, man, let's go over here and do this. I'm like, nah, I'm good. Y'all go ahead. Y'all got it. But you're scared now. Nah, I'm not being. I'm just being smart right now because that's right. That's I can right. see. We all can see what's on the other side of this action you're about to take. Yeah. Now it's yep. not going to change if you take this action. If A then B. So right. you know that's B right. is it's coming. Why the hell do you think you're gonna say if A then A? Point two. It's not going to happen right, like that. Right, right, right. It's not going to happen. It's the math. I think, you know, Dodge Effects, they they said it, you know, chickity check yourself before you riggedy wreck yourself. You know? <laughs> they were giving us jewels, man. Well, yeah, shout out, shout yeah, out to, uh, to school with Dre. They went to school with me at Virginia State University, man. They got their uh, contract while we were all on the yard, man. And when they said they, they won that uh, – talent show and got that contract and we were like oh, I ain't nothing going they ain't gonna get no record and then it came out and we were like oh yeah oh wow they yeah. they did it you know what I mean so yeah yeah, yeah. and they were dropping jewels man you know they were dropping jewels I'll tell you you know growing up without a father growing up without the consistent male presence in my life um I found that music a lot of music helped me find my way you know hip hop right. KRS one you know, mm-hmm. Daz Effect, Nas, um, Reggae, Bob Marley, you know, just because they're right. dropping jewels and giving you something to really, you know, chew and, and think about and, you know, look at and go back and chew some more, you know. Right. And without those right. jewels, man, I think I really would have been like a ship without a rudder. Mm-hmm. There's a whole lot out there, man. And, and all, once you start listening to what is being said, and not mm-hmm. only just hear the words, but right. internalize it. And not only with hip hop, but with, you know, the old drunk dude that everybody knows. If you sit down and yeah. have a conversation yeah. with him, he gonna hit you with yeah. a few jewels to take, put in your pocket, and walk away with. But That's you gotta right. be That's willing right. to have that. You know, you gotta be willing to have that conversation. And it's the same way with men and women mm-hmm. coming home from incarceration. You gotta. Mm-hmm. Be willing to have that conversation with them because mm-hmm. they'll learn from you, you're going to learn from them but once you remove the ego you won't have this problem that's right that's right, that's right <laughs> again, I think one of those those holy books that, uh, you, you can learn wisdom from the mouths of babes and fools mm-hmm. that's all in Proverbs mm-hmm. brother, yes sir yeah, okay, that's yes, what it's from you yeah. uh-huh, uh-huh a whole bunch of uh wise lessons that apply to life now. You know, some people yeah. say, oh, yeah. you reading, you reading this book, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, but you read a book about the dude that shot up the bank and killed 100 people. Right. So now put something that's worthwhile in your brain. Hey, didn't mm-hmm. say you had to go all in and, and fall out in church or none of that. Just right. saying... Whatever your religion is, if it's Islam, if it's Buddhism, Judaism, Christianity, you know, whatever it may be, Pentecostal, Lutheran, <laughs> Catholic, whatever. But it, yeah. it's one of those things where it, it's a guideline to live a moral life. Right. And not everybody needs that, but it helps. Right. It helps. You know, some people are going to just live a moralistic life anyway. But I think that, you know, if, if like you said, if they want to choose a spiritual or religious path that's going to help them get there, I think that's great, you know, because that's, I think all the traditions, they all really are trying to get people to do just that, to live a right. moralistic life and to realize the trueness of themselves, you know. Mm-hmm. 
And you yeah, see it a lot. Agree with that. You see it. You Sorry see to bump back in here, but y'all have a great, <laughs> great conversation. But and I've enjoyed the conversation, so I'm actually going to sit back and let y'all have this great conversation because I was enjoying it. I get to sit back and not be the main interviewer, but I was going to ask you what are some of the most important human value lessons that you think you learned since being out of prison and also while you were in prison? Because I know a lot of times we're oftentimes thinking about the value lessons that we learn in various parts of our life. So what are some of the value lessons that you think you learned? You know, I think the very first one um, is respect, you know, Mm -hmm. um, respect for my own self, which then pours out towards other people. You know, I think that's, that's primary, um, Respecting myself, respecting others. Um, other value lessons. Um, I think also, hmm, that's, you know, I'm, 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 I think I'm struggling with that right now. But I know that that right there, respect is, is first and foremost, you know. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. I know a lot of people do struggle with that and everything. When you go and talk to the young folks, and I know a lot of times they might uh, be – intimidated because you've been in this system or they may want to disregard you because you've been in this system. Mm -hmm. But what is the way that you approach these young folks and what is the kind of response that they give you? Because I do know that sometimes when we've tried those scared straight tactics, sometimes they are very effective and sometimes they got this attitude like y'all were talking about earlier that, you know, they're Johnny Badass and all of that and that nobody's going to scare them any sort of way no matter what you tell them. So when you encounter both the tough guys that got that kind of like bravado as well as some of those that are willing to listen, how do you handle both mm-hmm. of those? Yeah, and, you know, now that you frame that question, it, it takes me back to, to the values um, and because I think that, one of the things I like to do is I approach people um, with truth um, and I approach them with humility, you know, um, no matter if there's a rah-rah dude or if they're, you know, the afraid kid, you know, but I try to be myself. But I think if I'm, I'm, if I'm honest, if I'm humble um, and I'm compassionate and patient, you know, I think that these things help, you know, because, I mean, not everybody's going to take the lesson, the rah-rah guy or the, the scared kid, but I just try to give up my truth. You know, I don't, I don't try to scare nobody. I don't try to beat anybody in the head with it. I just tell them this is what I've been through, and these are some of the lessons I learned, and I hope that you don't take the same route to, to learn these lessons because I'm sure you guys have lost people along the way just as I have, you know, be their friends or people from the neighborhood who just didn't get the lessons. You know, and they got sent to prison for life or they got killed out there. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense, and that's a good way to handle it and everything of that nature. What about yourself, Dean? How do you handle that? Because I'm sure you've also got those guys that are trying to be super tough even when they're in the prison system, and you've worked this for a number of years. You've been my friend for a few. So definitely I'd love to know your thoughts as well. You know what? It's one of those things where the conversation first starts out, like they'll ask for something that they know good and well that they can't have. So then you tell them, hey, look, I'm not going to be able to do that for you. And they'll say, well, what are you here for? You know, and it's like, well, I'm here to make you think. Mm-hmm. It sounds it sounds <laughs> odd, but at the same time, you have a mind, you're not stupid. So now my job is to make you think, let's play this game. (laughs) And the game is every time we get together, we're going to have a conversation about something that matters. We can talk Mm -hmm. about all the non-essential stuff, but let's, let's, let's get into what, what's happening. Like right now, half a million people have passed from the COVID-19 in the United States. Right. Mm Mm-hmm. So you got people that, and it's one of those things where some people say, oh, man, you know, it's a setup. They're about to do the Tuskegee experiment on us and blah, blah, blah. But then my question is, well, you're entitled to that thought. But I'm wondering, if it were a Tuskegee experiment, how come all the others are beating doors down trying to get this vaccine? Mm-hmm. If they really wanted to take you out, all they got to do is put it in the Hennessy. Everybody want to drink that. <laughs> you know what I mean? Just put it in the Hennessy, dog. Any liquor you could think of, put it in the beer, yeah. put it in, and people go drop like flies. I said, 
It's no. not what you think it is. Do not get wrapped up into that. 500,000 mm. people have passed away from this. Not just yeah. black. Now, if they were all black, you have a valid point. But they ain't all black. There's a whole bunch of folks, hey. black, white, Asian, Indian, you know, Native American. They passing away from this stuff. So, dog, oh, well, they came up with a vaccine too fast. Okay. But in the age of technology, the Apple 13 just came out, and the 14 going to be out by the summer. So, if they mm-hmm. can make phones and all of that stuff, why do you not think that they could come up with a vaccine with advanced technology? This is not the 70s anymore or the 80s. That's right. Where it's That's going right. to take three to five years to have clinical trials and all this other stuff. Mm-hmm. So advanced now. So, now let's talk about this technology. Let's talk about some things because now what I'm doing is I'm active, helping you activate that brain. So, when you mm-hmm. say, you know what? Hey, man, I'm trying to get in this uh, college class. You serious? All right. Let me pass your information on to the educational department. I can't put a rush on it, but I can surely let them know that you're interested in it. And mm-hmm. hopefully, hopefully they'll call you soon. Now, what happens on it's the back COVID, end? Right. And then what happens on the back end, that phone call turns to, hey, look, I got this dude on my unit, man, real good dude. And, you know, trying to better himself is it Anyway, you could get him into the next college class. And they're going to give me the answer I gave you. We'll see what we can do. But then yeah. when you fast forward two months later, he's like, yo, I'm in the college class. Well, it wasn't me. It was the educational department, bro. Your turn is up. Your integrity. Right. Yeah, Go we got to have that integrity. Integrity is vital in everything that we do. There's no doubt about that. Integrity is so important to everything we do. Um I was wondering, uh, Craig, and everything, when you came out with the book and everything, what was the reaction of both your parents as well as the folks that you used to hang out with? And also, have you found yourself hanging out with a new crowd? Because I do know that sometimes folks say that when you're ready to change your life, you sometimes have to abandon some of those past friends and things of that nature. But then some of those friends have been through you, with you through thick and thin, and you probably decide to stick with them as well, and maybe you can see some ways to change their way. So I was just wondering the reaction of your friends and peers as you've been writing this book and definitely doing this work of restorative practices. Yeah, man. Thanks for asking that. And, you know, my family, they were very receptive of of me writing this book. Um, However, my sister suggested maybe I shouldn't write the book because um, it put some family secrets out there, or not necessarily secrets, but just some family business out there, and she was concerned about how people might perceive our family, but I told her this is my truth, and so it has to go out there. But she's been very supportive. My brothers have been supportive. Um, My mother, she was a bit hurt by some of the things I wrote, but at the end of the day, she was supportive. Um, Same with my friends. I have the same uh, set of friends. There's about six of them. They've been my friends since high school, and um, they've been uh, supportive of me throughout my time when I went to prison since I've been out. However, it does seem that um, in the last few years, though, um, my relationship with my, my crew, my, my main homeboys, has kind of shifted because it seems that maybe they're still in that, that one place. I, don't, I don't, don't want to get that one place a particular name, but they're in a place that I'm no longer there. So it's still love and respect, but we're not as, as tight as we used to be, you know. But then um, also you ask about am I hanging with new crowds, Um I moved to North Carolina seven months ago, um, and so every, pretty much everybody I meet is new. Um, but because of COVID, you know, I haven't really hung out with anybody. But um, I still have a brother that's here. But I did meet one good brother that is here, and um, he's about 10 years my junior. And um, we've been doing some of the same work um, here in North Carolina, and um, he's done about four or five bids himself. and. He's turning his life around, and so we've been connecting quite frequently via text or Skype, and we just met yesterday for lunch. And so, um, yeah, I think my, my the people that I'm attracted to and the people that I'm starting to be drawn towards um, are different than the groups that I grew up with and the, and the people that raised me. 
And we are seeing a number of folks that are doing this kind of work of trying to help our youth and get them out of uh, bad situations here in North Carolina. I'm actually here in Durham myself as well, and I know that Dedrick Dixon has done a lot of that work as well, and he was involved in the prison system. I think Otis Lyons has done a number of that work as well, and then, of course, Mike Anderson. So I don't know if you've had a chance to connect with them, but he's got an organization Mike does called Polish Souls, and I want to say he was serving a bid for um, like a death uh, kind of penalty and everything but because of the crime that he committed, but he did get off of that and is definitely doing a lot of work, not just here, but throughout the country because he's actually taking his film about his story around the world and all of that and definitely is trying to get that message out to a number of folks. I know he's been to like St. Louis and I think out to the West Coast and to a number of other places. I don't know if you had a chance to connect with those folks, but if you haven't, I'll definitely try to put you in touch with them because I know that they're on LinkedIn with me and I've also done a lot of work around the HI Heritage Center and so I know a number of folks that are in those fields, so definitely you should definitely connect with them. And I know, um, what, uh, Dean, we probably had best and her crew on about three or four times. Bessie Elmore and her uh, Mm -hmm. son was involved in the penal system, and they were actually trying to do that transition house kind of activity where uh, people are leaving the prison and then going into mainstream society. So that raises a question that I would love to get reentry. What kind of advice would you give to folks that are actually getting out of the penal system? Because we do have an international audience, and we do have an audience of folks that have gone through rough times, but also an audience of folks that have not had those kind of times, but they might have friends that have. So if folks are going through the reentry system, what would your advice be to them and the best way to get back into mainstream society? Yeah, man, and that's a great question. And, you know, I wrote um, my dissertation on that as well, you know, looking at the impact of emotional intelligence on helping people avoid recidivism. Um, so some of the things that I, I would tell people to do is definitely, and this may sound cliche, but it's really about the people, the places, and things that are in your life. That's a one big piece, you know, because that can influence some of the decisions you make, um, some of the places you go, and some of the things that you do. But I think the other piece is that people need to have their their mind made up about what they want to do. They have to be convicted in their spirit, in their soul, mm-hmm. that I am not going to commit any violent or any criminal acts. You know, and then third, I think that it's important for people to um, get some sort of training under their belt, be it vocational training or academic training, to the point where they can become um, certified, licensed, or degreed. You know, and I think with the people, places, and things, the right people, places, and things, um, the right mindset or attitude, along with the right training or capabilities to to earn a, a living wage, I think that that will help people. You know, but before before any of that, though, is, is what's most important is uh, for people who are coming home to have housing. You know, and that's something I can't tell people how to do, but I know that that's a big crisis for many of people who are coming out of prison. They don't have adequate housing, and without Mm -hmm. adequate housing, it's hard to establish anything else. Very true. Housing and a job. And how hard was it for you to find a job? And I would also be curious as to what made you decide to move to North Carolina. You spent all that time in Rochester, but I was wondering what (laughs) about North Carolina appealed to you? (laughs) Yeah, yeah. Well, I'll answer your first part, which was, you know, how did I find a job? And, um, again, um, I worked a lot of odd jobs at first, Um, you know, working temp jobs, working uh, any kind of job really I could find. But I continued to work on um, building relationships with people, um, with key people. And then, um, you know, I had some people in my family who knew some key people in the Rochester area. And so, you know, they put me on to certain jobs as well. But, Oftentimes, you know, again, another cliche, it's not always about what you know, but it's who you know. And because I knew certain people and because I was developing uh, new and different relationships with influential people, um, I was getting opportunities because I knew how to create and sustain um, a viable relationship with another person. Um, And I knew how to um, build trust and, you know, show integrity and all these things. And so I think that that helped strengthen my relationships with help people vouch for me. Um, 
So that, that's pretty much how I found the job. But then once I went to college and earned my bachelor's degree, I had an internship opportunity. And from that internship opportunity, um, the people hired me as a substance abuse counselor. And then from there, my professional life just kind of skyrocketed. So, you know, it was ins and outs, but it was all really based on the relationships that I formed with people. And then, and um, I know one of the things I want to hear about North Carolina, but I was going to say one of the things that I know that surprises people sometimes is there's oftentimes a misconception, and I'd love for you to talk about this. There's a misconception that some people have that if you've been in the system, that it's almost impossible to get a job. It sounds like to me that you've definitely did the right things in terms of getting education in order to get a good paying job and a job that. Um, is something that you are very much interested in and all of that and everything. And there's also this concept that folks can't vote and everything. So I'd love to hear your thoughts about that and how you actually deal with that. Yeah. Well, you know, I think that, again, if people who are in the joint or in prison, if they take the time to, to learn a great trade or to learn a skill um, and they take time to work on their people skills, because, again, learning to – to develop relationships with people, I think that that is what helps people get jobs. You know, oftentimes we don't get jobs from the want ads or from Indeed or whatever. Most of the time we land employment based upon word of mouth, somebody that we know. And so, again, if I can develop relationships and I can present myself as a, as a respectable person, and these are the things that I did and these are the things that I continue to, to strive to do so that people can say, hey, this is a good guy. Hey, we want this guy on our team. Um, building that sense of community, that's what helps people get jobs. Getting their, their skills set up and learning to create community, I think that that can help people get jobs. But, yeah, there's going to be that stigma. There's going to be that bias. People are going to slam doors in our faces when you're coming out of prison. But what I learned, bro, is that um, success and failure, they really start on the same they, – they are the same road, actually, you know, but people who – are looking for work and they get jobs, uh, a door slammed in their face. If they quit, they stop looking for work, they'll never find it. But they, remember, they started out on the same road as the successful guy who when he, when he faced obstacles, when he faced impediments, he continued to push forward. When his car broke down, he called somebody to come fix it. He fixed it himself. He might have been delayed, but then he got back up on the road and kept going versus the other person who just abandoned the car, so to speak. You know what I'm saying? So yeah, it makes a lot it's of really sense. about perseverance, perseverance and preparation. Yeah. And, I and you also said problem. something else that I think is, you also said something else that I think is very important that I think a lot of times we don't pay enough attention to, which is that sense of community. And I definitely think that whether you're coming out of college or coming out of the uh, prison system, that you need to have that sense of community just in life. And I think that as a society, we don't do enough with community. And we've talked about that even here on this show, how a lot of times yeah. we remember back in the day, me and Dean, about how, you know, we knew our neighbors in our uh, rural towns mm -hmm. that we grew up in and things of that nature. Mm -hmm. And, you know, if we didn't, if you didn't get a whipping just from your parents, you got it from the neighbor <laughs> and from Aunt Mate, who wasn't really your aunt mm -hmm. and all of that. But it would definitely uh -huh. give you – that spanking and everything, but I think that we've gotten away sure from that. So I'd love to know mm -hmm. your thoughts about how we're doing in terms of the sense of community and how we can do better in the sense of community within all of our communities. Yeah, and you know, man, that that's a heavy piece, and, and me and Dean were talking about that too when you stepped away. But, it, yeah, it, it's really about having that common unity. You know, that is what community is when a group of people have a common unity. But I think that so many things in, in this technological advanced society has driven us apart, driven us away from those values that really grounded our people, you know. And just to kind of sidebar, I've been listening to this podcast about the Green Book, you know, and it's talking about uh, how people, black people in particular, were in community back in those days, in the 60s, in the 50s, in the 40s. You know, we were self-sustaining. We were together. We looked out for each other. But, you know, today people are not doing that. So I really think that we're not doing a really good job of um, communicating or having a good community or solid community nowadays. You know, it's almost like every man for himself. Or if you don't go to my church or if you don't go to my mosque or if you don't go to my temple, then, you know, you're not part of, you know, my common unity, my community. You know what I'm saying? So I really think that we're struggling there, you know. Now, I definitely agree with you that we're 
No, that's all right. And I would definitely agree that we're struggling there in a lot of ways. We're not having that community the way that we should have that community. What are some of the other things that you would like to see society do better as, and just in terms of somebody that's come out of the system, but you did probably a lot of reading and a lot of reflecting while you were in the system, but I was just wondering mm-hmm. what are some of the things that were re- very reflective to you, and what were some of the books that you actually used to kind of like develop your own thought pattern? I know that sometimes people, when they go into prison, that's when they discover the readings of Malcolm X or the readings of Martin Luther King or even the readings of some of our holy books, whether that be the Bible or the Koran or even some of mm-hmm. our Buddhist books and things of that nature. So I was just wondering, mm-hmm. what were some of the books that influenced your own development as somebody that is definitely uh, – you know, coming to more of your full self. And I'm not going to say that you're at your full self because I'm one of those people that believe Mm -hmm. that we're constantly learning and we're constantly developing and hopefully we're Mm -hmm. always learning and developing all the way until our last breath. That's right, from the cradle to the grave, bro, from the cradle to the grave. You know, I I think um, what I'd like to see the society doing more of is to be um, less punitive to people who are coming out of of prisons and jails and creating – I guess for our governments to create better opportunities for people to become um, educated and trained and to find their ways back into mainstream society versus ostracizing them and not allowing them to um, get a job or to have an opportunity to vote to become a full citizen again. You know, I think when people feel included, when people feel that they're part of the community, they're more apt to be productive citizens. I think there's an old um, African uh, proverb, I can't remember it verbatim, but it's about the boy who was um, ostracized from the community. He came back and burned it down because he did not feel like he was part of the community. You know, so I think that there needs to be things that can help people um, become whole again, help them feel restored again once they get out of prison so that they can add on to the goodness that they bring that all of us have inherent within us, you know. But um, some of the books, man, that um, really moved me, one uh, in particular was the autobiography of Malcolm X. Once I read his story, I realized that, yeah, you can go down, but you can also rise back up and you can shine. You can shine like the sun, you know. But some other books that really moved me um, in particular were the writings of uh, Dr. Naeem Akbar, um, Know Thyself, um, Chains and Images of Psychological Slavery, um, and many other uh, titles by him. And then there was another book by, um, um, I can't think of his name right now, Sheikh Amta Diop was his name, The African Origins of Society, Myth or Reality. So many books. The Book of Proverbs is very powerful, you know. Um, I still go through the Book of Proverbs. Um, I read um, so many books. I, I can't even tell you, but that's, that's just um, – that's just some of them right there. But Malcolm X's no. book was the one that really took me on a ride. And After speaking of that and everything, and I, oh, yeah, definitely. Okay. And speaking of that, and I know Malcolm X even thought about that as well and everything, but how much do you think that we as a society – are almost as shackled as those that are in the system. Because I do know that a lot of times folks, when they read, Mm -hmm. they think about the fact that we are almost as shackled, those of us that are on the outside, Mm -hmm. as those that Mm -hmm. are in the inside. So I was just wondering Mm -hmm. some of your thoughts as to how much of the shackles are still existing on us, even if we've never been in the system at all. Absolutely. Myself and some of the brothers behind the wall when I was back there, we used to uh, share those exact sentiments that we here inside the penitentiary in many regards are much freer than the people who are out in the society because, you know, many of us are uh, locked and bound uh, by other things, you know, be they bad habits or debt or relationships or false beliefs or misconceptions, you know, and so those things oftentimes in a sense, suffocate us from recognizing and realizing our true potential because we become indebted to all these other things, you know, be they belief systems or, or again, like I said, financial issues or or, or habits that are not really healthy. So um, I think that the the greatest freedom one can find is when they realize that they are um, um, locked up, that they are confined in their mind, and then begin to take measures to free their own mind. 
Yeah, definitely got to do more work on freeing our own minds. And all of that, uh, definitely we've seen that a lot of times uh, folks are uh, not having the greatest attitude about us as people in general, whether that be African-Americans, Hispanics, Native Americans, or a number of others as well. So it does seem like we don't do as well as we should in terms of uh, supporting even our other minority groups and everything. So how important do you think it is for us to bond and to connect with other people from other cultures that may not be out of our African-American population, be that some of our Hispanic brothers that are struggling mm-hmm. as well as some of our, uh, even some of our European brothers that are struggling and some of our Asian and Native brothers and mm-hmm. a number of other cultures as well, even the Latin culture. So how important do you think it is for us to unify with our folks that are going through other things as well? I think that is so important for all groups of people to see themselves in one another because I think we're more alike than we are different, you know, but these external things that we have called culture or skin color or facial features, we use those things to separate us. But, we, again, we are more alike than different, you know. And so I like to uh, look at nature a lot. I spend time looking at trees, walking in the forest. But one of the things that really fascinates me are the ants. Mm-hmm. And how the ants, they tend to work together. They're some of the smallest creatures on the face of the earth, but collectively they achieve so many monumental things because they know how to work together. And so despite where we come from, what our belief systems are, what we look like, if we are struggling, chances are we have the same issue, the same oppressor, the same matter that's holding us down. And so I think it's very important for us to come together with other groups of people and for other groups of people to come together with us. But, again, uh, we have to get over um, these things, that these superficial things that keep us apart. Essentially, um, we have to uh, crucify our egos, and then I think we can see ourselves in one another. Yeah, I definitely agree with you on that, and I'm glad that you're out there observing nature. That's something that I've been big on here in North Carolina is definitely going out, and a lot of times you can notice a lot of things if you pay attention to, as you just said, the smallest animal like the ants or even sometimes what Mm -hmm. the birds and other folks are doing as well because I sometimes think that they are sometimes even giving us warning signals that we don't necessarily want to listen to, just like I think that the ancestors send us warning signals to our dreams and a number of other things, but we have Mm -hmm. to be in tune to all of that in order to actually understand the messages that are being sent to us because I do think that a lot of times we're not in tune with our own belief system and don't necessarily Mm -hmm. follow what we should be doing. So I was definitely wondering Mm -hmm. your thoughts on that because I do think that sometimes we don't pay enough attention to what's going on around our society. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I think if we go to the forest, bro, you're not necessarily going to find any Internet high-speed connection, right? But you'll get a great connection if you go out there and just walk and and observe, you know, sit amongst the trees, listen to the birds. And that connection that I think you get is that connection with yourself, you know, that connection with that, that part of yourself that is that God being that has created all of us. Maybe everybody doesn't believe in a God or a higher power, but it's that higher entity that's within us. I think when we cut out all of the distractions, I think that that's when we become more in tune, you know. And so going into nature, that helps me do that. It helps me tap into that piece of me. And I think that it can really help most of us. Um, Because in essential, I keep saying going into nature, but we are nature, you know. So, again, tapping into ourselves and understanding ourselves. And I think, again, we have to – take measures to eliminate many of the distractions, which are oftentimes uh, in today's society, these electronic devices that we have, you know. Yeah, those electronic devices can get in our way and everything of that nature. I know a couple times on the show, and this is going to take it just in a different direction and everything, but a lot of folks were speaking of that electronic devices. There was a person that was in 1600 a while back that used Twitter and a number of other things in terms of mind control and things of that nature, and now we've got a new administration. And, of course, some folks, even in the new administration or in the out in the public, were concerned about the vice president staying on some prison matters and things of that nature. So I was 
just wondering, as one that has been involved in the activist space, how are you feeling about the new administration, and do you think it's going in the, the right direction, and do you think that they will do right in the form of prison reform? Because I know a lot of people are open that we're going to get prison reform, but then other people are concerned about some of the things that she did when she was in California. But I was just wondering your thoughts as to whether you think that this is a time that we need to even be thinking about prison reform. Well, I think we always need to be thinking about prison reform, and I'm hopeful that the new administration will make some uh, make some good decisions on prison reform and do some things that can help eliminate um, mass incarceration and do some things to help empower people who are most at risk for going to prison and people who have been to prison, and again, helping them to regain their citizenry. Um, I know that there was something that uh, – uh, the current president signed um, about uh, prison reform, and people were thinking that what that meant is that he's going to annihilate or, or to get rid of private prisons or something. But I think that if people looked a little closer, all that really was saying is that he's not going to renew their contracts. So a lot of people that went up in arms, they didn't know that it doesn't mean um, he's not going to um, get rid of them. Well, people think that he's going to get rid of them, but what they don't know is that he's just not renewing the, the, the contract. So these private prisons are going to still be there. You know, these state prisons are going to still be there. But I think the verdict is still out, and we have to see. You know, but I think the the, the public is putting a lot of expectations and pressure on this administration. But only time will tell, as Bob Marley said, time will tell. <laughs> Yeah, time will definitely tell. That's going to be the key in everything. Time will tell, and then we'll know what's going on in that regard and all of that. But I agree with you that time will tell, and we'll find out in that regard what's going on and all of that. But definitely I know a lot of folks are hoping that we're going to get that prison reform. And what are your thoughts, and I'd love to hear from both of you and Dean, about this whole concept of private prisons versus public prisons? Because I do think that we did get into a period where it was nothing but uh, or more private prisons, and a lot of folks are upset about that. So what are your thoughts about the nature of the prisons and whether we need to get away from these private prisons? prisons. Oh, man. Well, I mean, when we think about prisons and we think about their history, um, we can tie the prison industrial complex back to chattel slavery, you know? And so, in essence, I think that that's all the prison system really is, is an extension of the chattel slavery. I think the 13th Amendment says something to the degree that, you know, slavery has been abolished except in the case when someone has been duly convicted of a felony, you know? And so, when you look in these in, in, in these penitentiaries, most of them are overpopulated by black and brown bodies, the same descendants of people who were once enslaved in this country. So, you know, I don't think that much is going to be happening with these prisons. I think we still have to fight against them. But um, I think they're going to be there for a long time. Yep, definitely, and I agree with you on that. Dean, what are your thoughts on that? Well, I, I know... When I, I guess I look at it, I work in the state system, and, and you, you notice the differences between uh, a state-run institution and a private institution, for-profit institution, which makes they every one of them gets money based on bodies. And like I told mm-hmm. a guy in the prison in New Jersey, you're worth sixty thousand dollars to the government. Mm-hmm. For every for every year, every one of you is worth sixty thousand dollars per year. It costs more money to incarcerate you than it does to educate you. And mm-hmm. within that sixty thousand dollars, you probably get about five thousand dollars worth of food and about two thousand dollars worth of health care. So you tell me where the rest of it is going. And and when you have private prisons, they can kind of fly under the radar because there's a lot of things that they can get away with doing where you're kind of limited as to who you can reach out to or who your family members can reach out to. They'll refer you to the president or CEO of GEO or, you know, one of those private entities, and it goes nowhere. So now mm-hmm. – you you kind of you have individual stuff when you talk about the the slavery component of it a lot of individuals that are incarcerated 
have no clue. Like I said before, learn the game because the Thirteenth Amendment told you what the game was, and mm-hmm. when they kept that one piece, and you know, guys said, "Well, we can't file taxes and we can't do this." I said, "Well." Remember, you have a fourth strike. And they were like, well, I thought you said it was three strikes. Yeah, I did. But the fourth strike is one that people usually don't talk about. So now you're black, you're male, you're a convicted felon, and you're still counted as three-fifths of a person. Because that mm-hmm. one thing, they never changed. They cloaked it and said that, yeah, black people had a right to vote. And then the Civil Rights Act of 1964 came. They got to revisit it once every 20 years. But never once did they say a black man and a black woman are counted as whole people. Mm -hmm. So now when you get in trouble, what happens? The first thing they do is they put you in chains, handcuffs. They tell you you have the right to shut up. Because anything you say, we're going to use it against you. So you have uh, only the right to remain silent. Shut up. Don't talk. They take you to process the center. They take away your name. They give you a number. Mm -hmm. And then the game begins because not only do you have one number, you have three. You have the jail Hmm. number, you have the state number, and you have a federal number, in addition to the Social Security number that they gave you when you were a little kid. So now mm-hmm. they got four ways, four ways to track you. They take you, they now they don't take blood like they do back in the days, but now they swab your mouth and get that DNA sample out of you. So should anything else happen and you spit on the ground near a crime scene or touch a door and you don't know that something just happened, guess who they coming to look for? You. Mm-hmm. Because you belong to the United the state of wherever whatever state you're in, and by default the United States government. They can give you a job, yes, but they're only gonna pay you probably about a dollar a day. So you're gonna work eight to twelve hours for one dollar. Let's do the math on that. You know that that's less than fifteen cents an hour. Mm-hmm. Can't file taxes on it. They're gonna take some of it in some places, the private prisons are charge you for your stay so now you the little money you do get half of that's got ripped away because you're paying towards your stay but they just got $60, and your medical care right they just got sixty thousand dollars from the government for you and then they charge you to call your family members and global tail link had a monopoly on that thing man just robbing people blind mm-hmm. you know and nationwide Private prisons, mm-hmm. state prisons, jails, lockups, everything. And mm-hmm. you want you want a Snicker bar? Oh, you can get a Snicker bar. Hopefully, your family gave you some money because this Snicker bar is probably about three dollars. Mm-hmm. Where the same Snicker bar in a Wawa or uh, Royal Farms or, or any other convenience store is like a dollar ninety eight. You know, back when. Back when you could smoke in prison, and they they were charging ten dollars a pack back then, you know. And then one day they said, "No, nah, you know what? We're gonna make this a non-smoking facility." So guess what, y'all? Yeah, you've been here doing your nine-year bid. You smoke cigarettes every day, but starting tomorrow, this is a smoke-free facility. How is that for withdrawal? <laughs> you know, we're gonna give yeah. you food you can barely identify that. We say it's nutritious, but really has no nutritional value. One of the hookups may have more nutritional value than some of the stuff I've seen on trades. Absolutely, man. Absolutely. You, get you know, when I came out of the penitentiary, I developed Crohn's disorder. I think it had a lot to do with the food I was eating in there. You have Crohn's disease? Yeah, and I think it came, uh, I think it, it, it happened because of the, some of the food I was eating. I don't know, but I think so. Okay. I've had Crohn's for 24 years. And um, mm-hmm. I take uh, Humira for it, you know, but mm-hmm. luckily now you get sick in prison, lead into that. You get sick in prison, dog, they're going to give you one or two things, Tylenol or Benadryl. <laughs> <laughs> yep. And you're going to pay for it, too. Yeah. you yeah. sick, man. you sick as a dog. They're going to give you Tylenol or Benadryl. 
Yep. In extreme cases, they may give you some Pepto Bismol. Yeah. Other than that, man, you ain't getting it. You got to be super dead, almost sick, hospital sick, and then they're gonna ship you to the little, you know, hospital unit, and then you're gonna have to stay there until you get better. Mm-hmm. Man, I've, I've seen some weird things, and it's like, dang, man, this is how is this? But at the same time, when you flip back to the 13th Amendment, well, we could treat slaves like that. That's right. Because they're not human. Right. You have those those who wear the uniform who have that same belief, and they come and make your day very hard, you know, and Mm -hmm. you're hoping for just to get some type of relief until that day comes, because every time you get back in that cell, the walls get smaller. Yes, sir. Next thing you know, you feel like you're sitting in a two-by-two room, and you got a bunkie that might snore or pass gas or get sick all the time, and Mm -hmm. you get stuck in there with them like, I can't even get away from this dude, man. And, you know, all of those things contribute to the feelings of hopelessness, the feelings Mm -hmm. of uh, feeling less than because you're already beating yourself up. And that's one of the biggest things, but give yourself first. And then yeah. what, what other people think of you ain't none of your business. And I say it like the old school uh, uh, elders used to say, what people think of you ain't none of your business, but what are you oh, going to no. do to better your situation? It's going to mm-hmm. be hard days. It's going to be days where you feel like giving up. But make sure you hold on to those individuals that always got on you and always saw what you finally start to see in yourself. So when those mm-hmm. days get tough, you can have that conversation with them. They won't judge you. They'll give you, uh, if they can help you, they'll help you. Or they'll send you to where you can get some help. But prior to the side, let that ego stay where it is. And don't be afraid to ask for that help and to follow the direction. It takes a little longer. But then when you get to where you would like to be, it starts to get a little easier. And that's perseverance. Yes, sir. Yeah, perseverance is very important. There's no doubt about that. You got to get that perseverance on a regular basis. And I know that that's definitely something that is going on regularly. And, uh, I was glad, and I dumped in part of the conversation there that uh, you are feeling a little bit better than uh, going in the past. So glad that uh, things are at least a little bit on the improved side, Dean, because definitely uh, my partner in crime, i got to be having him in good shape at all times, no matter what's going on <laughs> in his life and everything of that nature, because he is my partner right. in crime in terms of this podcast and in terms of a number of other things as well, because he knows that he's also part of the uh, international broadcast media team as well, because uh, Kimberly and some of the other folks are always asking about him. And then, of course, he's part of a number of other teams also, like the Black Business Expo and a number of other things that I'm involved with. So he's just part of the team. We know he's got that lovely wife of his, but he's still part of a number of other teams that are going on as well. So glad to have you as part of our team and everything. Yes, yes. Right on. I'm getting there. Oh, I know you're getting there, definitely getting better, starting to improve and all of that stuff. So that is a great thing, and we're definitely glad to have you as part of this amazing team of folks that we have here doing amazing things and continue to do amazing things as well. So one of the things that I always do, uh, and glad to have you as our amazing guest and everything, you're definitely sharing a lot of insights. But one of the things I try to do on most of my shows, and Dean knows this, is I always try to get people to give words of encouragement words of positivity and you definitely dropped some of those earlier but I would like to hear any that you've got right now and everything that you would like to share with our audience so any words of uh, encouragement and positivity that you would like to share with our audience I'm sure that we would love to hear them right now and all of that because we do believe in positivity and trying to make sure that folks are being encouraged whether they're listening here or whether they're listening in India because we do have a uh, platform that is from India that is part of what we have going on as well. So, Dean will be talking about some of the platforms that we're on when we wrap up, but any words of positivity and encouragement that you can share with our audience, I'm sure folks would love to hear from that from you. Absolutely, and once again, thank you, brother, for having me as a guest here 
Um, but some some good words of advice, man, is um, one of the things I always remember um, is no matter what we're going through, you know, life is going to be full of highs and lows, but especially when we're going through our lows, not to give up, not to turn back, but to continue pushing forward. And sometimes pushing forward means maybe just sitting for a minute and listening to yourself, listening to your soul, or considering who can come in to help me move a little bit further. But the thing is, is to never give up, you know, never give up. So yeah. that is my word of encouragement. Continue to, to keep your eye on the prize. And definitely. And, and before you, before you go, I do want to, uh, Give a shout out to Uncle Mo's Barbecue and Catering, man. That's up there, Rochester, hey, New York, 493 yeah. West Avenue, if, if I remember correctly. Nice little spot. Yes, hey, sir. if you're ever in Rochester, make sure yeah. that you yeah. stop by Uncle Mo's and get you some of that good food every time that we go up there. Some of that smoked turkey. You know, yeah, every, right, every time we go to Rochester before we leave. We get that Uncle Mo's mm-hmm. eat in. And then we make our way back down to New Jersey. So definitely yeah, want yeah. to shout out Uncle Mo's, man. They catered my, uh, they catered my graduation party back in okay. 2018. I had them, yeah, they got the dope food. And when we first got up there, I had to get used to, you know, uh, Chala. I was like, they said, where you at? I said, man, I'm on Chili Ave. They were like, nah, nah, Chala. And I was like, Okay yeah. then. All right, I'm getting it. I'll get it sooner or later. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You definitely know the space there. Yes. I think sir. everybody call it Chili Avenue when they ain't from there. I sure did, man. And they bust out laughing. They was like, nah, dog, it's chocolate. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's a good joke too, man. A lot of folks don't get that one. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. So we greatly appreciate you know, we, we definitely appreciate the conversation, man, and, and best uh, keep pushing. That's that's all I can say. Yeah. It, it, keep pushing and, and 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 keep your hand to lift up as you climb up. Those that are ready to go, go grab on and come on up. Those that are not climb ready, and lift. get it later on. It's still going to be right here to pull you up. So whenever you're ready. That's right. Go ahead and grab on, and we'll bring you up, too. And there's no judgment. We're going to try to get everybody to where they need to be because hopefully this thing that we call the prison industrial complex will eventually start to fade out. And as people start to uh, do different things to better themselves mm-hmm. and to better be better people for their families and for the community at large and, and then – who knows, man? We might be old as dirt, but it might be a different world and a better world. So that's my hope. Man. Absolutely. Absolutely. Got to keep pushing. Team, you're going to be old as dirt? You can't be old as dirt. That's out of man, house. I'm, I'm trying to be older than dirt. You know what I mean? I'm trying to be around. That's right. <laughs> that's right. That's right. Well, I told y'all before, I'm going for a record. You know, there was a guy named uh, what Solomon and a couple of others in the Bible. And I know that they say that it's an impossibility to have happen. But I have decided that you might as well go for 200. I mean, nobody's done it before except for some of those biblical characters and some of those characters in the Quran. But, and I don't think that I'll pull it off, but I might as well set it as a goal. I mean, there's nothing wrong with setting a goal. It's impossible. You, you might as well set, set the goal. And then if it don't happen, I'll just be up there and... Heaven's Gates saying, hey, look, I know it was an impossible goal when I said it, God, Jesus, and Gabriel, and the rest of the folks up there, but I just thought I'd give it a <laughs> shot anyway. No right. doubt. No doubt. Yeah. Hey, man, it's been a pleasure, man. Thank you, Dr. Wally. Likewise. We appreciate it. It's you been know, truly a pleasure. Here. I do not know because my phone died, whether you gave those words of encouragement or not. That's what I was trying <laughs> to get have happen and everything, but I'm sure you did because I know that Dean's going to have my back and everything. So, Dean, I know we've only got about three minutes to go, so if you want to tell uh, the good doctor where he can find the, the replays as well as a number of the other shows that we've got on the platform because we are always glad to have amazing guests. And if there's any folks that you want to bring onto the show, we would love to have you share our information with them because we always love having finding good guests. I know I found you through the wonders of a LinkedIn because I'm oftentimes scouring and looking through the LinkedIn platforms and everything, trying to find out amazing people and didn't realize that you were in my uh, backyard practically being here in North Carolina now 
But I can't really talk about that because what was it about a month ago? I found a guest, and it turned out that it was in the Dean's backyard of literally Newark, New Jersey. So like I said, sometimes when I find them, we find them right here in our own backyard because I was doing the interview, and Dean was like, "I think I know that place." <laughs> yes, yes, do. Yes, yes. So hey, y'all, uh, it's straight talk with Dean and Mark, man. Monday night, 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Be sure to catch the replays on the Skyhawk Radio Network tomorrow afternoon and Wednesday afternoon, both at 2 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. And if you miss those, we got replays and more replays on Radio Public, iHeartRadio, Google Podcasts, Spotify, Spreaker, TuneIn, Stitcher, Podbean, Apple Podcasts, Podchaser, Podcast Addict, Castbox, Pod Follow, Deezer, Jay Saban, and right here on Blog Talk Radio, where we are part of the Level Podcast Network, where you can catch other shows such as the Black Girls Guide to Surviving Menopause, the Chef Gang Radio Show, Funk from the Front Seat, Funk Music with Zach, Learning Unwrapped, Less K-12 Better, Marketing with Russ. Hashtag Rush Selfie, Mona Shake in the Minority Reports, Mullings, Music and Memories with Mark Lee, The Online Dinner Party with Mark Lee, Plan a Good Day Podcast, Treatment Road Trip, Just one second, let's try to find out if we can get this thing pushed down a little bit, and I got all kinds of stuff going on in the background, it just won't stop. But we'll get back to this list. She's on call. Uh, I'm missing some, huh? Yeah, uh, the Just we, Podcast. We, see, we got the North Carolina one, so we the did Mark not mention that show. one. We, yep. Finish Social Hour, Virginia no, Interface Live, and WNC Original Music, man. That's all of them right there. And like I always say, man, when you walk outside your front door, it's showtime, and the world is your stage. Just make sure that people are not watching the rehearsal. With that being said, it's the six man Dean Geronimo. Have an outstanding week. And hey, y'all, we see you in seven days. Peace. That's right. We'll have more amazing guests and more amazing conversation in seven days. Still trying to figure out who those amazing guests will be. And hopefully, it'll be March the next time that we're on, which means that we'll be around the corner from spring because it'll be March 1st. So it's still technically winter. But I'm hoping that we're going to be having some more of this warm like weather. And no snow, but I do know that when I talked to Greg Fisher earlier, he remembered a snowstorm that we had in April. So I'm not putting anything past the weatherman or past the forces that be. So I'm not rooting for no snow in April or in March, but I also know that that could possibly happen. But I'm looking for a good old fashioned spring weather. And I think that those groundhogs said that we're supposed to have uh, early spring. So I'm hoping that the groundhog that said that is the correct groundhog, because we know that the groundhog <laughs> sometimes disagrees. Uh, <laughs> Hey, that 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 groundhog was smoking some dog, and before weed was legal, so we got to find out, and we we we'll find out in a couple of weeks if what he was smoking was messed up or if he was just smoking a new for it. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yeah, so, peace. peace, my brother, peace, ladies and gentlemen. We'll see, take it easy. see you next week.